Hello, everyone. This is uh, once again author Tim Brown of the book uh, Uncommon Athletes, and I'm I am truly blessed today to have with me uh, Coach Katrina Merriweather, the head women's basketball coach at uh, Wright State University. Welcome to the show, Katrina. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. It's yeah. good to see you. Good to see you as well. Uh, you've all grown up now. You know, I remember those days when you guys used to come over to Columbus and, and compete in our uh, Take ABC tournaments. That was a good time. Uh, uh, on your sure. backstory, I was listening to another broadcast of you and talked about how you, uh, you know, most times it's the parents who get the kids involved in, in basketball. But I understand yours is a little different, that you got you got your dad involved, you know, your dad who, who's a, a longtime AAU coach and high school coach in Indiana. How did you get him involved in basketball? Well, it started with fifth grade. I participated in the free throw contest and he had never forged basketball on me, even though Grandpa Will had played at Addicts with Oscar Robertson and Daddy had played in college. And I mean, they had me pretty young. So I actually remember watching him play at the park at Crown Hill uh, growing up on Martin Luther King Street. And uh, it kind of at that point never dawned on me to play. And then I play, participate in this free throw contest. And I get second place, mainly just because I figured out how to shoot it straight. And I was kind of bigger than everybody else and strong. Um, so when I called and told him that I wanted to play, uh, I signed him up at Tabernacle Presbyterian Church League. Wow. And he at the time was in Arizona because my grandfather was an agent. And he was doing some jobs with him. Uh, he was out in Phoenix with William Bedford uh, with the Phoenix Suns. Mm -hmm. And he came on back and he started coaching me at TAB. And at that point, he got together with some other coaches and some other players from that league. And before you know it, we were a couple things before we were the family. Uh, we were the Bed Bedford Riverside Pistons. Yeah. Uh, we had all kind of names with iron on letters. And uh -huh. that's probably the, the the group you remember that wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. How was that growing up in a basketball family? I know Indiana's big in basketball in itself. How was that growing up in a basketball family? You know, I have to tell you, outside of just remembering being around a lot of really, really tall men all the time, uh, I can remember I was probably seven or eight and I had gone to a dinner with Isaiah Thomas and Magic Johnson, found out that Magic Johnson and I have the same birthday. And for a couple of years, he sent me birthday cards when I was younger, but it never connected playing for me. Um, my great grandmother, Nana, that I talk about a lot, she had me with pigtails and dresses and patent leather shoes and lacy socks. And uh, I don't know that if she hadn't passed away when I was nine, that if I, I ever would have played a sport because that wasn't really what young girls were doing in our neighborhood and in our family. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was really cool in retrospect to have all these pictures with all these people. You know, from when, you know, daddy and, and grandpa Will were, you know, heavy in the NBA. And I, I think that what it did was just show me a, a great love and appreciation for talent. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy watching good basketball mm -hmm. uh, and what they did and have always done is treated everybody that was in their environment like family. And I think that that's just where it all started. All right. Good stuff. In the book, I, I talk about passion. And how athletes, you know, everybody says has have passion. Where did your passion for the game come from? When did it begin? When it really, when it really hit you that hey, I like this basketball. I can do something with this game. Well, I was twelve, and Daddy told me that he was either going to train me to have fun, or train me to be the best player I could be. I have to admit, around 12, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into when I said that I wanted him to train me to be the best player that I could be. Uh, he's a real big believer in offensive development and skill development. He is what I call a Russian trainer, where you do the same drill 100 times. I remember wiping tears and going home to my mom and saying I wanted to quit. So daddy taught me everything I knew about basketball, uh, but mama made sure I didn't quit. Because I'm telling you, I come home some days and doing that same layup drill 50 to 75 times made me want to quit every day. Um, but it, it taught me to appreciate and have respect for the game, to love the fundamentals, to uh, to appreciate the uh, just the root of what basketball meant. And it was hard work. Uh, it was dedication, commitment, like all those words we always hear. And I know that that started with the training in the gym with just me and daddy. That's good. That's good. Sounds like that. One of the chapters in the book, we talk about preparation, how important that is, you know, to prepare. And when you're prepared, you'll continue to be passionate about what you're doing because you're prepared for it. 
you know, you're ready for it. So it doesn't, doesn't impact you. Let's talk a little bit about your story, high school career. I know you had a great high school there in Indiana. Let's talk a little bit about that and how, okay. how those high school days were. So I went to Cathedral High School and that was after spending K through eighth grade in the public school system. And um, IPS, Indianapolis Public Schools were going through a transition uh, with regards to how they were zoning people to go to different high schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and daddy was not interested in uh, where select schools put me. And so him and my mom made the decision to send me to Cathedral High School, which I was not happy about. I was pretty upset because my friends were all in the public school system. Right. Um, obviously, there was going to be a, a cultural shift for me. Um, being at an all black middle school, Christmas addicts. And uh, I go there and, and what they were paying for was the environment. It wasn't about if you were going to college, it's which college are you going to do? It wasn't about, are you going to play sports in college? It's which college are you going to choose to continue to play sports in? And I think that ultimately that was the biggest difference for me, you know, that I was constantly surrounded by competition every day. Um, I learned how to sit down and cheer for other people because I didn't play varsity right away. Um, so I split JV and varsity and that was a huge uh, learning lesson for me. Um, and I think that it taught me uh, to respect deference, people who have put in the work, people who had been there before me. Um, so that was a very valuable lesson. And we just won like crazy. And so as, as much as we can talk about all my accolades, I, I have been very fortunate to have great teammates uh, from club ball all the way through my my school years. So we, I make the Indiana All-Star team. And again, we, we do that because we win. Like we went one sectionals for four years. And so it's really easy for people to say, hey, I'm going to pick the leading score off the team that wins a lot. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that's what I attribute all of my accolades to is that I really had a great team and great teammates. And so with me being the leading score, I just got some accolades behind it. Right. Let's talk about the uh, vision for the family and how that came about and, and, and the impact that uh, summer basketball exposure had for you, for, you, uh, for you and your teammates as well. Well, and not just because it's you. Take ABC was the first time that we left Indiana. Mm -hmm. So in the 90s, without social media, without the Internet, without all these different ways to publicize all the players all over the country, you only had two ways to get out of your state. Mm -hmm. And that was to play AAU regionals, go on to state, finish in the top three or four, and then you could go on to nationals. Mm -hmm. Well, as you pointed out early on, we weren't good enough to win state or be in the top three and go to nationals. And so the exposure that we got was coming to take ABC. Mm. And I remember sitting there during your all-star games. It was the first time I saw Samika Randall and Helen Darling. And Helen Darling is spinning from one end to the other. Samika Randall's turning her, turning her, turning her. And I remember sitting in those stands like, whew, I gotta go home and get better. Because this is, this is not what I see every day. So the, what it meant for us was we got to be outside of our own city, outside of our own school district, outside of even our own state, and see that there's so much talent out there outside of, of Indiana. Um, and then eventually we got good enough to where we would go and qualify for nationals and, and we went to Tennessee and Washington and, and then saw some players nationally. But without those opportunities, there's no way that we would have gone to college and left out debt free. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, a, that's truly a blessing. That's truly a blessing. Mm -hmm. Then you went on to play uh, college basketball to, at the uh, University of Cincinnati with a good friend of mine, uh, Coach Lloyd Pirtle. Uh, how was that experience? And how was that? How, how did, really, how did did uh, high school basketball, summer basketball prepare you for that next level? I tell you, it prepared me in a lot of ways in regards to work ethic. But one thing that was very different for me when I got to UC, like we were a very, very tough program. Like you walk in our weight room and it says Bearcats are thick, quick and nasty. Like that's what it says on the wall. And so it's a very aggressive style of play. Um, we had a group before me that called themselves the basement group. Okay. And they were the ones that didn't have winning seasons, but they grinded and they worked really hard. And then when my class came in, we were the first top 25 class that Lori and Mike and Esther and uh, Don had signed. So we had just started to get talented, I think. And 
And when I say talented, there were a lot of good players before us, but you know how those rankings go. Mm -hmm. And so from there though, that, that publicity, I think helped continue and the players just got better and better and better. And one thing that I was not very good at was competing with my teammates. Mm. And, and I think that that was something that hurt me early on because in summer ball in high school, when you're the best player, you don't really develop that, that mentality where you have to go into practice and it's just grind and you're competing for minutes. Uh, so I walk into college, I'm like, oh, my teammates, you know, like it's like <laughs> summer ball in high school and right, right. Mm -mm. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like that at all. And it, it grew me though. Mm -hmm. Like I got tougher, mm -hmm. um, I got stronger. I learned how to to compete and leave it on the floor and still be cool outside of the floor. So there are a lot of very valuable lessons. And Lori created that environment. She created an adverse environment so that when we played the games, the games were nothing. And when I became an adult, I realized that that preparation mm -hmm. is what helps me get through life when things are tough. I really can go back to that time and say, shoot, I can get through anything mm -hmm. if we made it through that. And um, she was very influential for me. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. One, one of the things we talk about, one of the chapters in the book, uh, the Uncommon Athletes book, is about being an overcomer, you know, having to overcome some situations. Can you describe a situation maybe on a team during your college career that you just had to deal with and overcome it and how you were able to overcome that? Well, I'll tell you, one of the toughest things for me when I first got to college um, was I was taught to shoot inside foot pivot. Mm. And then I got to UC and they were strong believers in the one count, which is like a, a jump hop into the shot. Mm. And I can remember being so frustrated because I only knew how to shoot the ball one way. Mm. And I felt like I was in workouts and the ball's going over the rim because I got all this momentum, you know, from this hopping and I, my shot's not adjusting. And I went through this phase where I was like, God, am I just not very good? You know, what is, you know, what's going on? And what was really phenomenal about the coaching staff at the time was they said, hey, anything that you do a lot and consistently will turn into a skill. And Lori's phrase was always repetition is the mother of skill. Wow. And I use that to this day while I'm coaching, because you think back to the days when they were shooting a ball between their legs and just throwing it up there and it would go in. Well, if you practice doing that 500 times a day, well, eventually the ball's going to go in no matter how you shoot it. Um, so that was a, a very valuable lesson for me that, again, I carry uh, with me that if you want to be great at something, you got to do it over and over again. There are no shortcuts. There's no quick fixes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we talk about that uh, going into coaching, going into, I know you played your four years and then Coach Perto gave you an opportunity as a grad assistant uh, coach. And how was that going from, you know, being a player to a coach, specifically in the same program? You know, I know that was kind of interesting, you know, being going, it's not like you left UC, you're right there. And a lot of those girls who you played with, they're still there, you know, and now you're, mm -hmm. they got to call you coach now, <laughs> you know, what not. How, yes. was that, how was that deal? You know, it was to this day the most important and critical year of coaching for me in my entire career. Mm -hmm. uh, being on one side of that fence and then going to the other side and sitting in those meetings because you're a player. Because I joke with my kids now, like they all think that all coaches are bipolar. They all think we're crazy. They all think, you know, that we don't do anything except watch film. We've got no life outside of them in basketball. And to be on the other side of that and realize that so many of the decisions that she made that we didn't understand made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And that we solely were responsible for what we thought was her bipolar behavior because she was just simply feeding off of us and whether or not we did what we were supposed to do. And if our grades were good or if we worked hard in practice and uh, it, I would look at that year and I say, man, now I, now I get it. Now I get what it's like to have to make decisions for the greater good in the whole team instead of an individual player just being caught up in how a decision affects them individually. And it, it will, I, I can't see another year being more critical in my career than the year that she gave me the opportunity to be in the same program the year after I graduated from it. Yeah, no, that's great. Being a, uh, and that's what you were, what we call an uncommon athlete. When you walk into a gym 
and you're recruiting kids. What is it that, and just speak to this for these young athletes who are, look, who are watching this, what are those things that coaches are looking for that maybe help them stand out, you know, so to speak, different from everybody, different than other players? What are some of those qualities you look for? So I'll explain play hard because I got really frustrated with that term as a player. And I've noticed that, that our players get frustrated with it too, because if you're out there running, jumping and sweating, well, in your mind, you're playing hard. Mm -hmm. But what we say that you're playing hard is you are relentless when you rebound. That when someone is on a fast break, you sprint to catch up with them. And we've had to identify what, what playing hard really looks like. Mm. And I think a lot of players think they do, but most really don't. And we're talking multiple efforts. You know, like you, you try to steal the ball and maybe you overrun it. So you sprint back and you catch up with your person again instead of you run out the play and then you stop and you stand and you drop your head because you didn't get the steal. Mm -hmm. um, coaches will constantly talk about your behavior on the bench. You know, your team scores. Is your head still down because you got taken out the game? Do you come off the, out, the, out the game and put the towel over your head and don't watch the game? You know, are you a good teammate? Mm -hmm. are, are you clapping? Are you cheering? Just as loud for other people as you get excited when you score. Mm -hmm. Or is the only time we see you playing hard is after you get a bucket and then you want to be the first one back on defense. Mm -hmm. We're paying attention to all those intangible things out there. This generation has been called the entitlement generation where they walk in and think that they, they got out, like you said, now they have all these press clippings, all these accolades, they're – all Americans, I'm ranked in the top 10 in the country. You, know, you shared about some of these top recruiting classes and all that kind of stuff. How do you deal with uh, getting players to be selfless, not selfish, being, being a selfless player? Well, first of all, I think that's very difficult to do. By the time we get them and they're 18 years old, and that's something that has been instilled in them at home and or with their high school and or with their their grassroots coaches, mm -hmm. it is very difficult for us to get them to be any different than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why we pay attention to some of those um, things when we watch them play on the floor that we mentioned earlier and why we make it a point, especially at Wright State, to talk to everybody in that player's circle. Mm -hmm. Because I want to hear what type of person they are. Mm -hmm. Because it is nearly impossible to redirect someone's character. I can deal with behavioral issues all day because most people just need a little bit of attention and then you can get them to, to act right. You know, but when you have a character issue like entitlement, mm -hmm. because you feel like you should have things because your other teammates have them. Um, and what you're talking about specifically is because they play on these grassroots programs and 10 of the 12 get division one scholarships, everybody in their circle now expects scholarships and expects everything that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. So a big talking point for me, coach, is once you get your scholarship, let's talk about how you can keep it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we talk about in summer school when our players first get to campus. Um, so again, I, I think that we just really have to do a, a good job of explaining to them that this is a privilege, not a right for you to be on a team. And one thing my father has always said is a player needs a team. A team doesn't need a player. So we need to make sure that you are doing everything you can to, to stay on that team. Um, so that's, we just talk about it openly and honestly, coach, you know, what that looks like and, and how you will not act that way, not in this program. Sounds like a, I keep hearing daddy come up. I keep hearing <laughs> what my father says. Sounds like that, yeah. that impact of a, uh, dad, and, and I know that you want to have that same impact, you know, that same impact on your players, you know, later in life. Uh, they'll talk about Coach Merriweather. And what were some of those things that you would want uh, your players when they leave your program to remember about you? What are some of those lessons that you want them to get and learn after those four years? We say a few things, but one of them is I tell them that if you work hard every day, and you are the best person that you can be. And then you get home at night and you reflect on how you can be better at those two things the next day. Everything that's meant for you will be yours. And I, I want to make sure that our kids understand that being a good person is always the most important thing. 
you having a 4.0 or averaging 25 points a game, you eventually will no longer be a student. You will eventually no longer be an athlete, but you will forever be a human being. Mm. And so the most important thing is for you to serve other people. Um, I like to believe that we talk about certain servant leadership a lot. Mm. Um, I'm not that authoritative, stand up in front. You got to talk to me this way type person. Our, honestly, our program is is like the family meets the the YMCA meets the division one program. It, it's all kind of, <laughs> it's all, you know, yeah, like it, it's all, it's all smashed together for me and for us and the staff that I have, the reason we're able to, to impress upon them the importance of being a good person is I have five people on my staff that believe the same thing. And we are constantly constantly have trying to tell them that they have to have a growth mindset mm -hmm. just get better and be better than you were the day before in in life in school and basketball and of all the things we talk about coach I hope that that's what they take away um, at the end of four years is it takes a lot of energy and effort to be a good person but it's absolutely worth it yeah and I think uh, from your staff and just yourself getting young people everybody has a story Everybody's a story. Everybody's gone through some things, some bumps in the road. And That's I know you are a, truly a champion of those uh, helping, helping persons with an opportunity. And that, I think that really goes back to your roots, you know, growing up and, and just being a part of. And the family was really a family. It wasn't just talk. It was, it was really a family. It was really, and I share with you, I remember your dad bringing some kids that he saw a girl at a McDonald's and just put her in the car, you know, just to uh, get her out, just to, just to give them that experience, to get them out of that environment, you know. And I see you, you have opened up a world of opportunities for these young ladies, you know, a world of opportunities for them that they appreciate, I'm sure, and, and will value, you know, and will value those experiences. And that's what life's all about, just, just being better. And uh, we all are blessed. We are blessed. Absolutely. How dare us not, you know, uh, be able to bless someone else. Uh, as, as we close, uh, as we reflect on, on, you know, our conversation going forward and backward, just leave, leave this with some young people and some coaches as well. What are some of those tried and true things that, that still work? You know, we're in a social media generation, all this kind of stuff. But what are those things that you can hold your hat on that you know as a coach that this will, will get it done? If I had to pick one thing, okay, I'm going to have to give you two okay. because you and I have had some other conversations. Yeah. And um, I think that the biggest difference between this generation and our generation is that we were raised to trust and to respect authority. Mm -hmm. uh, that means coaches, teachers, police officers, and especially our parents, grandparents, people that were our elders. And I think that this generation has been exposed to so much. They've seen so much more than what we saw, you know, from 15 to 16, 18 by the time they get in college, that they, they are a very distrusting generation. Mm -hmm. So it is critical for us and again, this is different than what was done for us. You know, Lori expected me to respect her because of her position and because I was raised to do that. Well, this generation needs to know that we care about them. I literally had a kid tell me, coach, I work hard for you because of how you treat me. And this is a kid who had a reputation for not really working hard. And, and we met as a staff. I'm, I'm telling you, I really think we can get the most out of this kid. And she just affirmed that that was true when she said, you care about me. So I'll do anything for you. I'll run through the wall for you. I'll play hard every day. And it was, it was very glaring that this is how this generation is. They need to know. Um, now, what comes along with that for me is a non-negotiable will always be accountability always the worst thing that we can do to any any young person coming through is have them believe that their decisions and their choices don't have consequences mm -hmm. so when our kids get a zero on an assignment they get a tally mark and we run on accountability day they miss class they're late to a meeting it doesn't matter what it is and then the second part of that coach is we teach them to forgive each other and themselves when you make that mistake and we, we hold you accountable for making that mistake, I don't bring it up again. Because if not, we're going to send young people into the world 
that think that they have to punish themselves and allow other people to punish them for their mistakes. You are allowed to be forgiven for the things that you do. And so what I really, really hope is our kids walk out of here and they are accountable and responsible for their behavior. They don't point fingers and don't blame other people. You take a look at a situation and you say, what could I have done better? What could I have done differently for the outcome to be what I wanted it to be? And we just don't spend a lot of time on things we can't control. The only thing in this whole world you can control is yourself. And so accountability is a huge, huge deal for me individually as a person um, in our program. So those are, are probably the two things. They got to know you care. And in the same token, you got to hold them accountable so that they know that you expect them to be great and you're not going to settle for anything less than that. Those are powerful words. I think young people are, are looking for those uh, in today's world. You know, they need someone to hold them accountable. But at the same time, love them through it all, through it, you know, and that well, you hit on the big one with that forgiveness. That's, that's a big one. That's powerful. And so I'm I'm just I'm just so blessed, you know, just to just to have you on here and have this opportunity to share and to watch you grow and mature. And I know God has even greater things for you. you know? Oh, thank you very much. And just so you know, that's a thing for us, too. We talk about faith a lot and you have to be careful. You know, you have to be careful because everybody's spirituality is different. Uh, but we pray before every practice and that's something that our kids are that they want to do and we teach them that that the flesh is weak and, and the only person in this whole world that you can depend on outside of yourself is your faith in god and so we, we talk about that a lot on those bad days when people fail you you better have somebody much more powerful than that to lean on so i appreciate you saying that and it's a blessing to still be in touch with you after all these years oh yeah oh yeah well well thank you for taking the time uh, uh, to be a part of this on today and i want to remind those who are watching uh, to continue to watch you can subscribe to the uh, coach tim brown uncommon life uh, youtube channel and you can uh, see this video along with others about how to become a, an uncommon athlete. So, Coach, we appreciate your time and looking forward to a great season this, this year. Thank you. Fingers crossed and player, <laughs> prayers lifted. Everybody stays healthy and safe and we'll be able to play a little bit. All right. Be blessed. Thanks again for your time.